Welcome to the 2019 Milken Institute Global Conference. We are pleased to have you join us and look forward to engaging with you over the next few days. To kick off our opening session, please welcome CEO of the Milken Institute, Michael Cloudon. Good morning and welcome. Uh, this is, of course, our 22nd annual Milken Institute Global Conference. You have a wonderful, exciting time ahead of you. Uh, you're going to uh, uh, be dazzled by the number of choices you have. Please keep in mind that uh, if you miss sessions, uh, all of the public sessions are going to be online. They're being taped. Rooms are going to fill up, so get there early if it's something that's important to you. But the best way to keep track of what's going on at the conference is the Milken Institute app. So please download the Milken Institute app uh, at, uh, if you haven't done so already. That'll give you not only access to the biographies of the speakers, but also changes in the program. And of course, speakers have been added. Speakers have uh, had to cancel for one reason or another. So this would be a good way to keep up with everything. So uh, please do that. OK, enough with the housekeeping for the moment. Uh, we're going to get started with an exciting two-part session. For the first part, we have, um, we have something that really fits the theme of the conference perfectly. Because our theme, as you know, is driving shared prosperity. We'll talk about this a little bit more at lunch. Uh, but the goal of having the human capital in the world constantly be able to improve their lives, to be able to have more meaningful lives, is one that the Milken Institute firmly believes in, and which I'm sure most of you who are here share. No one has a more important role in driving shared prosperity than our opening speaker. We're delighted to have with us Christine Lagarde, who is the managing director and uh, chairwoman of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, we've been uh, looking forward to having her join us for some time. And uh, to moderate our discussion with her, we're delighted to welcome uh, our uh, friend, uh, Jerry Baker, who is uh, the editor at large of the Wall Street Journal. So please welcome Madame Lagarde and Jerry Baker. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Madame Lagarde, for being here. Very busy time for you, as ever. Just thank got you back for from, you, too. Just got back from China for the, the Belt and Road Forum. It's, uh, it's not true that the acronym for that is BARF, I think, is it? No. <laughs> BRI. Uh, anyway, let me, a lot to talk about, uh, a lot of things going on in the global economy and financial markets. Let me start, if I may, with the outlook for the economy. About a month ago, you said in the run-up to the spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank that the world economy was at a, was at a delicate moment. Mm -hmm. Now, since then, we've had data from the United States that show pretty solid growth. Last mm -hmm. week's GDP number for the first quarter, 3.2%, very solid. Meanwhile, the Eurozone continues to look weak. China's okay. Where would you say, is the economy still delicate, or would you say we're actually seeing more divergence now in the global economy? Well, we still think that it's a, it's, it's a delicate moment, given the uh, still very synchronized slowdown of the momentum for growth. And that's the reason we called it delicate. Uh, you have about 70% of the global economy which is slowing, um, still growing. And as I said yesterday, we're not uh, expecting a recession. It's certainly not in our baseline. And everybody, including the highest authorities, were very surprised at the 3.2 um, number for the United States quarter, first quarter. I think everybody had explanations as to why it was going to be low. You know, the shutdown of the administration, the weather, uh, the perennial bad first quarter, and there it is, 3.2. So 
that will certainly lead us to uh, reassess um, our forecast for growth for the United States. And clearly, given the size of the US economy, it will have an impact uh, overall. But I think we need, I don't think that we, could, we should, you know, uh, draw lessons from one quarter. We should wait, we should analyze the numbers, we should wait until we see the productivity number in particular that are due soon to see whether there is divergence, to come back to your point. We have now had, though, three of the last four quarters in the US have been above 3% growth after a prolonged period in which we saw... I'm saw sure the fourth quarter was above. Three. Three of, three of three, the fourth quarter was weak, the two previous quarters yeah. were above 3%. Yeah. So we've had, we do seem to be having sustained growth. I mean, the president... Um, mm -hmm says it could be even stronger, but, it, but, but again, you think it's too soon to say that the United States seems to have moved into an elevated phase of growth compared to the, 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 the pace that it's seen over the last 10 years? You know, I, well, first of all, we need to analyze exactly where growth is coming from. On, this, on the first quarter, there is clearly a big uh, jump in the inventory number. We're not seeing consumption going up much. We're not seeing big investment either. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two, the productivity is going to be critically important. Uh, the odds are that the productivity numbers will be good, and if that's the case, then it's really encouraging because we have been waiting for uh, productivity you know, being higher pretty much across the board in all advanced economies, and we're not seeing it. And this is not post-crisis. It started earlier than the crisis, but given the investment in new technologies and what is expected out of uh, those you know, capex movements that we've seen in the last four quarters, there should be some movement on productivity. If we see that, I think it's, it's encouraging because it would mean that the, you know, the growth potential is improved and it, it, would, it would plead for a more sustainable growth at, at higher levels. If productivity is still at the low end, um, I wouldn't be as, as, as optimistic. One economic variable that does seem pretty, to pretty well to be performing pretty well the same around the world is inflation. Mm -hmm. um, we've got significantly suppressed inflation United States just had numbers this morning again uh, for last month, for, for March actually, I think, for, for which showed weak, uh, relatively weak inflation. Um, Eurozone is extremely, has very, very low inflation rates. China's a little bit, a little bit higher. But we do seem to be into this prolonged period now where, uh, you know, despite high, despite low levels of unemployment, especially in the United States, despite sustained growth in most of these countries, we have this suppressed inflation. What, what do you think is the best explanation for that? It's, it's, it's highly mysterious, and if I had the answer, you know, I'd, I'd be queen of economy, which I'm not. Well, you uh, are. That's no, exactly no, no. what you are, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Your Majesty. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's a bit of a mystery because, uh, you know, the, the famous Phillips curve should lead um, inflation up, given that we have very low unemployment. And that's not only the case in the US. If you look at, the, at Germany, for instance, where unemployment is at, at rock bottom, where participation is high, and yet inflation is still stubbornly in the, in the uh, sort of, you know, the, the, in between uh, 1.2, 1.7 uh, at the most. And, and inflation expectations is the same, core inflation is the same. We will probably see higher inflation in the months to come, given what we, we, we are expecting on the price of oil. You know, that, that will have an impact, but it will not impact core inflation. And it's, it's difficult to explain. It's, you know, those who try to explain will argue that although participation numbers are relatively high, because of the baby boomers exiting the, uh, the job market, we have more younger people joining, therefore employed at lower uh, salaries, which could be a, an explanation. You have people coming to the market who were not in the market, including in particular women where participation rates are increasing, coming in at lower employment, uh, uh, at lower wages, unfortunately. Um, you have aging, which also is a factor. So you have different, you really have to dig into the uh, employment numbers and underneath the numbers to really understand whether or not the Philip curves is likely to work at some stage. We still believe that it should work and that inflation should, uh, should pick up gradually and, and slowly, but it's, it, it should have, Yeah, we've been honestly. saying that for at least three, four, five years. G given, yeah. given how weak inflation is, do you think that central banks, the Fed in particular, obviously, which late last year was anticipating a significant uh, tightening of policy, of course, this year, obviously, it's backed off that, but that central banks maybe have misjudged this, that they haven't, they haven't um, inflation has uh, underperformed the Fed's expectations every year, I think, for the last five, six, seven years. 
Is this, have, have, have monetary policy makers got this wrong? It, it wouldn't be for, I wouldn't say that they got it wrong. No, they have a mandate. Now, the question is, is the mandate right? But the mandate is price stability. Uh, the, the approximate number that has been set, you know, for decades now is at or around 2% in order to allow for growth of, of, of the economy. But as you know, there's a lot of discussion about whether that, you know, whether, there's a sort of, whether that is a symmetric, symmetrical target and whether actually, given how weak inflation has been for so long, we should perhaps be it's time overshooting. To, exactly. Should, should, do you, do you well, share that view? No. Do you think the economy... Well, no. let me put it a different way. Do you, you know, think, the, the, do you think uh, the world no, economy I would benefit I'll tell you what I find quite extraordinary with this theory is if you cannot get it up to two, why setting it at four make it, would make expectations much higher? I, 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 I'm a very, very practical person. I just don't see the logic of it. But maybe some very smart economists are seeing so, it. So, to put it another way, you... <laughs> <laughs> you you, you don't think... You don't I was not think including you. Eh? Certainly yeah. not. I was certainly... <laughs> Uh, I would hope not. I certainly don't qualify under that category. But um, do you, oh, yes, you do. Do, do you not think? Do you think then that um, the, econ the world economy? We shouldn't really be looking to looking for a little bit extra inflation. Actually, as far as you're concerned, no, 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 no. That's not no. what I'm saying. Uh, you know, ev everybody would like a little bit more you inflation, would, you but I don't think that setting the expectation at a much higher bar is going to necessarily trigger higher inflation. I think it's, an, it's, it's going to be a matter of wages, it's going to be a matter of supply and demand, it's going to be a matter of you know, the economy uh, responding to those policies. Let me uh, quick turn on to, to, uh, to China, because as I say, you just got back from the very important uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, meeting there. President Xi Jinping did make some important uh, commitments to changing it. There's been a lot of dissatisfaction, obviously, in many of those countries that, are, that have been uh, the recipients of, of loans and, and, and some of the terms in which those loans have been dispersed. What do you think of... Did, did, you, did you get the impression from your meeting with him and from that meeting overall that they are really serious here about changing the way in which that, that, that initiative works? You know, I said publicly during one of the, uh, the forum that, as the English say, I suppose, although I said as the Americans say, which was much resented by my colleague Phil Hammond, of course. Uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. It was our language originally, remember that? Yes. Oh, you borrowed it from them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're not quite as protective of our language as the French are of theirs, but uh, that's... Uh, um. Entrepreneur, oh, yes. Oh, well, exactly. <laughs> 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 Uh, Touche, I might say. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> so back to back China. To China. <laughs> yes, yeah. Neither of us knows what the Chinese for entrepreneur is, I suspect. So it's, uh, yeah. no, but the Chinese you themselves yeah, are beginning yeah. to know pretty well. Um, you know, what, what I found striking is not just the words, because there were plenty of uh, green belt, uh, clean belt, meaning we must avoid p corruption and we must avoid those practices. Uh, there was a lot of use of the word sustainability, and all of that by uh, the president, by the prime minister, by all speakers who intervene on the, um, on the Belt and Road initiatives. What is more meaningful to me is that for, for weeks and weeks, we have been discreetly working with the Chinese authorities, both at the PBOC, the, the People's Bank of China, and at the Ministry of Finance, to really um, explain how debt sustainability matters, how you know, dumping financing and debt on the back of a country is not necessarily going to be good uh, for the country, it's not going to be good for the borrower, it's not going to be good for the lender. And how by anticipating that and calculating properly a debt sustainability going forward is actually going to be good for both. And the fact that the, fi the finance minister announced publicly the day before the Belt and Road official start of the conference, that they had now approved, they didn't call it debt sustainability analysis because that would be borrowing entirely from uh, our usual standards, but debt sustainability framework, which you know, by all accounts is perfectly compatible with what we understand as debt sustainability analysis. The fact that they announced it, that they recommend it uh, for use on all projects, to me indicates that it is now part of the process that they will, they will, you know, it will take them, it will take time to, to acknowledge, take ownership, ruminate, and then spit it out to project. But I think it's, it's a clear issue. Added to which, when you're a lender and you have borrowers in trouble, 
you start thinking twice about how and when and to whom uh, you, you, you lend and you finance projects. So I think this is sinking in. The fact that it's taking the shape of a debt sustain sustainability framework. The fact that um, I think the Chinese people themselves want cleaner air, better river, rivers, better water, protection of the environment is leading the authorities to actually uh, take ownership of this environmental sustainability which was mentioned over and over and over and I think so publicly that I don't I don't see how they could renege on that still on China Treasury Secretary Mnuchin said uh, just this morning actually that they're they think they're into the final stages here of these long negotiations between the US and China over trade uh, perhaps within the next couple of weeks we're going to have a go or no go decision as to whether or not these tariffs are going to be imposed from your conversations in China with the president and and also the, the US administration do you get the sense that actually a deal is going to be done, is close is, are we going to get are we going to get a deal do you think you know i'm a desperately optimistic person <laughs> so i, I think so do you, i think do, so well, yeah. let me put it another way is china going to make the real changes verifiable enforceable uh, compliance, um, compliance checked changes that the United States wants from your sense of what the Chinese are willing to do, whether it's on intellectual property, on technology transfer, on access to the Chinese mm -hmm. market, are they really willing to make those pretty significant changes that the US seems to want? I would say yes, and I have two indicators. Uh, first of all, uh, Steve, Stephen Mnuchin yesterday at the Milken Institute Forum actually uh, said publicly that um, the enforcement, enforcement mechanism that has been much in discussion was actually negotiated. Number two, if you read very carefully President Xi's speech of two days ago, at the end of the speech there are a couple of paragraphs in which he's really sort of kind of discreetly broadcasting what I believe will be announced in that deal, which is a mechanism between governments to actually make sure that there is in implementation, and if there is no implementation, that there is enforcement. And I think that by just taking ownership, by announcing it on his own territory, at his own conference, he's kind of um, outlining what we will see in a few weeks. That's my gut feeling, it's my reading of what he has said. I'm not privy to the conversations, I don't know whether, you know, negotiations is only finished when it's finished, and um, the fat lady hasn't sung yet. Talking of negotiations that aren't finished, can we turn to Brexit? Um, <laughs> um, very briefly, a quick, a quick tour d'horizon. I'm not going to ask you what, what's going to happen with Brexit because literally nobody knows. Um, but one, let me ask you this question. It's fair to say that the Brexit process has not exactly been demonstrating British Britain at its finest. Um, it's been a devilish and complicated and ultimately f so far futile exercise. One thing that's pu are you puzzled at the mar the market seems to have taken it totally in stride. I mean, the the for the last six months, when deadlines have been missed, when the negotiations gone on, when every single proposal has been rejected by Parliament, when we have no idea what's going to happen, pound has been stable, equities have moved in line with broad global indices, no panic in the debt markets. Are you surprised that people aren't a little bit more? The markets aren't expressing a little more. Seem to be expressing a little more concern about the uncertainty. Well, I think, first of all, um, a tribute to Mark Carney as governor of the Bank of England. He has handled the situation extremely well. Of all the sectors of the British economy, the, 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 the financial sector was the one which was probably ready the earliest in case there was a no-deal uh, Brexit. And I think the fact that all these precautions were taken, uh, that he himself, together with Mario Draghi at the ECB, got an agreement in place enough kind of interoperability, for lack of a better word, between uh, the various uh, clearing platforms. I think that must have given some confidence to the markets. And, and Britain will always be Britain. Keep the options open until the last hour. <laughs> I say that about the Europeans too. But um, on uh, another quick question around the world on debt. There's a lot, lot of concerns have been expressed in the last year about the levels of debt. Total debt in the economy, especially non-financial corporate debt, has risen back to levels that we saw, uh, higher than levels we saw before the financial crisis. Sovereign debt has risen in many countries too. Um, obviously, interest rates are very low, so, so debt sustainability doesn't immediately seem an issue. But how concerned are you about the overall level of indebtedness for the global economy? I'm concerned. I'm, I'm concerned for, you know, I have a... a, a 
double concern. The first concern I have is that given the, uh, you know, the, the financial loosening, um, given the interest rates that we have ar around, at least now, um, there is that new theory that you can just borrow your way into the future and it doesn't matter. Well, I think it matters. And, so you're uh, not a fan of modern monetary theory? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, I think it, it works in very, very specific circumstances, but we're not in those circumstances. And while there might be an element of that in the United States, not all the criteria are in place to make that actually palatable and, and sustain. It's not sustainable, number one. So I'm concerned about that because at corporate, uh, at um, household, and at governmental level, there is that sort of complacency about it, saying, you know, if it's cheap, let's, let's just load it. That's one concern. Second concern I have, which is maybe of more or less acute in, in this part of the world, is the level of indebtedness of the low-income countries. You know, we have 40% of low-income countries that are at debt distress or close to debt distress. Well, that in and of itself is not a huge amount because we're talking about small GDPs in the main, but we're talking about an awful lot of people. And, you know, people in a country which is suffering, where, where macroeconomic stability is, is in peril, uh, that means a lot of people who are going to seek fortune elsewhere. It means a lot of disarray, it means a lot of misery, and I think that we should all be concerned about that. So we are calling, and we raised our flag more than a year ago, a year ago watch out, you know, this excessive debt is going to weigh on, on us and is going to be a problem. On that, and, and going back again also to the inflation question, one of the puzzles um, for the global economy does seem that in the last, in the 10 years since the financial crisis, the kind of relationships that people took for granted as defining the way the economy works, if you get very low levels of unemployment, Phillips curve, you'll get high inflation. If you have very, very high levels of debt, you'll get high interest rates, particularly sovereign debt, you'll get high interest rates. We, the United States is running you know, a, a, a very, very large deficit um, in, by peace, in peacetime and outside a recession, the highest ever. Yet 10-year yields are way down, 2.5%. Negative yields in Europe, despite high levels of debt there. Is that something... Is, is, are we just going to get back to sort of normal relationships eventually? Or do you think, something, do you think there is something fundamentally changed about the economy in the 20th century, you know, Larry Summers talks about secular stagnation, others talk about Japanification of the, of, the, of, the, of the United States and others. Is something fundamentally changed or is this all just delayed? Are we going to get, finally get back to those relationships working again? I think relationships are going to be different and uh, I don't know whether it's a fundamental shift, but it's certainly one that is beginning to factor in the aging phenomena that is affecting almost the entire uh, global economy with the exception of the African sub-Saharan uh, countries. But if you look at the rest of the world, it's aging and it is having a very significant impact on all the factors that you've mentioned. Um, whether it's inflation, whether it's um, relationship between interest rates and volume of debt, all of that is, I see it as very strongly related to aging in a land, on a landscape where productivity has remained low. What could take us out of that sort of changing landscape is productivity, which is why I'm so focused on the numbers that we'll be seeing. And I want us at the IMF, and I know others are very keen to do that as well, to be able to better measure and better assess the impact that new technologies are having on, on the level of productivity. We might be measuring productivity in a funny, skewed way, which is not applicable any longer to an economy where you know, services dominate, where virtual economy is much stronger than real economy, and on and on and on. There's a lot of soul-searching uh, in the world today about capitalism and about the state of capitalism, whether it, can, whether it needs fundamental reform, whether it should even be replaced. There's a lot of interest in socialism, it's a kind of socialism anyway, if, in this country for the first time. Some people like Ray Dalio uh, and Jamie Dimon, who've been some of the most successful capitalists in the history of capitalism, are wondering aloud whether or not the current system can survive. What do you think is wrong? What needs, in one minute that we have left, what can be done to fix capitalism? <laughs> <laughs> and you've just lost 10 seconds of it there, thanks to that laughter. Yeah. Well, sometimes it's good to have a, a bit of, a <laughs> bit of humor. Um, you know, I, I don't think that globalization is going to go away. Uh, I don't think that it can continue in a sustainable way with the level of inequality that we have around the world. And if those issues of inequalities are not addressed at multiple levels, uh, both in terms of opportunity, 
in terms of focus on the excluded, in terms of desire for people to have their roots, to have their culture secured and preserved, uh, to feel respected and included, uh, for women to be part of the game at all levels of societies, uh, for um, investment, public investment in particular, but private as well in health and education going forward, then, then the system is going to be under threat on a continuous basis. And I fully appreciate why Ray or Jimmy or others, Larry also in his uh, annual letters, all of them are flagging this. But it's one thing to flag it and to say, well, this is part of us and this is a problem and we have to own it. The second thing is, what do we do about it? And how do we address the issue of uh, inequality and inclusion. More importantly, if I may, because I have seven seconds left, <laughs> I want to say that we will Thank not you. be talking about that in 20 years' time when the planet is completely gone. So I think the environment is far more important than any of that. Thank very you. Very quick final question, if I may. Very, very quickly. Um, you're more than halfway through your second term as um, at the head of the IMF, queen of the economy. <laughs> um, your term is up in 2021. Do you want to serve another term? I'm looking at the options, maybe. Just like the Brits, keep the <laughs> options open. <laughs> Madame Lagarde, thank you very much indeed. That was very thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For part two of this session, please welcome your panel on The Investor's View, moderated by Senior Executive Editor at Bloomberg News, Stephanie Flanders. Okay, well, uh, thank you. We had a really great um, Christine Lagarde is always such a class act, isn't she? <laughs> really hard to follow. Yeah. Um, I mean, be after as opposed to understand. Um, but we heard, I think, we heard a lot in that short session about the delicate situation for the global economy. Madame Lagarde has called it uh, precarious in the past. The big focus on productivity growth, where that goes, the importance of that, particularly for the short term. Her continued mystification at the low level of inflation and, and dismissal of this crazy idea of raising inflation targets, um, which was proposed by her own chief economist, a, a former chief economist a few years ago, interesting. Um, worry about the level of debt. And we heard about how to fix capitalism in 30 seconds, along with the <laughs> environment. But we didn't hear, and it's not a surprise, we didn't hear the investor's view. That's what all these guys are for. Um, in a revolutionary decision, we're actually going to do exactly what this session says it's going to do, which is give you the investor's um, perspective. If I quickly introduce uh, my panel, starting on the on the, my far right, Tom Fink, Chairman and CEO of Bearings, David Hunt, President and CEO, CEO of PGIM, the investment arm of Prudential, Scott Minard, uh, CIO of Guggenheim Partners, Ron O'Hanley, uh, CEO of State Street Corporation, and at the far end, Laura Warner, who's the Group Chief Risk Officer for Credit Suisse. Um, Tom, let me start with you. We're going to talk about a lot of those long-term issues, very important for investors. But this is Milken, um, and I do run economics for Bloomberg, so I sort of feel like we also have to ask a little of the short-term question. And the question of the hour has been, this morning, 
is the Fed going to cut rates just a few days after we had that 3.2% 3 3 print for US GDP? Does this tell us the world has gone completely mad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, you know, I, one, I think it's very hard to follow Ma Madame Lagarde, and, and when you think about uh, where we are today and, and, and having someone like her in an organization like an IMF, you know, that gives me a little comfort because we, we do need great people like that. Look, in the, in the current environment, it is very, if you go back to the fourth quarter, you're sitting there, uh, shift in Fed policy, you're, you know, we're worried markets are down and, and you're thinking, okay, could this be it? You know, could we start the inevitable slide into recession? And then you get numbers like we've recently had, and you're back wondering, okay, well, there definitely aren't raising, and we're starting to talk about cutting, but maybe not. And, and I think the key as an investor is, if, we, if you spend all your time kind of guessing at that, you know, it becomes very hard to have conviction. And, you know, Fundamentally, and, and we have a big fixed income business, big credit business, we've always shied away from making a guess on the movement of rates and really looked at, at the fundamentals. You know, where can we find fundamental value uh, in markets over time as they trade and, uh, against each other? Um, I, I just think it's very hard to guess at what an, uh, a, the Fed or any central bank would do when, when they're not certain themselves. Mm -hmm. David Hunt, I mean, what, what are you thinking about the Fed now? Because we, we, see we have gone, we've gone a long way from, from December, maybe too far. Yes, we have. And I think uh, as, as wonderful as the Secretary's presentation was, actually, we would disagree on almost every point in terms of the macroeconomic situation. Excellent. That's <laughs> what um, I'd like to hear. Uh, first of all, this is not a synchronized slowdown at all. Um, the U.S. is actually doing very well, and we would argue that it's actually doing better than its long-term potential, and so we're rather optimistic. Um, we're quite worried about Europe. Um, you know, I think we've all known that Italy was uh, in, in a technical recession. Um, we have the Brexit uncertainty, but I think what surprised us is what's happening in Germany and the real slowdown that we have there. And then we actually are, remain optimistic about China. China had a slowdown for uh, last year. Uh, they are absolutely uh, investing to reflate their economy, and we do believe through the course of this year that that will come back. So we think it's actually a situation where there's quite a lot of disparity around growth. Secondly, uh, we don't think the Phillips curve is coming back. Um, great theory, um, but uh, the world has really changed. The combination of demographics and technology has meant that those old relationships don't hold, and I think if we all wait around for inflation to behave like it used to, we're going to be waiting uh, for a long time. Um, and finally, on productivity. Uh, productivity uh, absolutely is the key way out for all of us uh, as far as the economy goes. Um, <coughs> But companies until 2018 were not investing enough in their own workers to drive technology. We haven't seen the level of real step up in investment that would be required to believe that productivity is going to, to grow. Now, I will say that over the last year, we start to see real green shoots. And we're more optimistic than we've been on productivity. But I would say we've got a long way to go and a lot more investment to do to really move that needle. Okay, so, Scott, I'm going to try very hard. I'm an economist. I love to talk about macro, <laughs> but I want to keep taking it back to the investor perspective. If you're thinking about the, this short-term outlook and some of the factors we've, we've just heard, you know, what are the implications of that for us when you're looking as, as a relatively short-term investor? Right. Well, you know, I think in the short run, what we're seeing here is, as my colleagues have said, we're getting a bounce back in global growth. Uh, that is certainly for a market in the United States where uh, we are currently priced for a reduction in rates. That means that in all likelihood we're going to have to give some of this back and we're going to see long-term rates rise and the yield curve steepen. But of course, you know, there are vulnerabilities in the system. Uh, we have, you know, uh, a, a debt crisis going on in Argentina right now. Uh, we have a train wreck occurring in Italy. Uh, so, you know, at any moment, uh, there can always be some event that comes out of the dark, like the Asian crisis, which would cause the Federal Reserve, I think, to react very quickly uh, to something like that and reduce rates. 
But that is not the base case. The base case is the economy's picking up momentum. Uh, I do believe that uh, this lull in inflation that we're getting right now uh, will slowly pass away. Um, and that uh, in, by the time we get to December, we're going to see another pickup in inflationary pressure, which will cause the Federal Reserve to have to act to, to increase rates again. Um, but the, um, uh, the one thing that I think is most telling is risk assets. Um, Lyle Brainerd at the Federal Reserve uh, expressed a lot of concern about the inflation of risk assets prior to the December meeting. Now, in the wake of the December meeting, of course, we had uh, a big sell-off in risk assets. Uh, but now, risk assets are back to where they were before. The only difference now is that not only are equities inflated in value, but bonds are now inflated in value. So uh, we are, we're continuing to inflate assets, and we, we are not really, uh, given where credit spreads are in corporate debt, being compensated to take on a lot of risk uh, in the economy. So my view is that uh, uh, even though the economy is strong, uh, it's probably a good time to, to lighten up on risk assets and, uh, and prepare for possible rate hikes. Well, I was struck, Ron, I mean, uh, when I was at JP Morgan, I got very used to reading John Norman, and I still read John Norman. I was struck by a quote from him the last few days. During this cycle, the most significant drawdowns have occurred when macro and policy surprises met overvalued and overowned markets. That's effectively what Scott's talking about. Are you concerned? I think in the, in the medium term, I would be concerned on that. But going back to your core question about what are investors facing, you've got this situation now where there's this uh, extraordinary global hunt for yield. Um, and I think that's one of the major reasons that you're seeing the, um, the yield assets uh, and, and the prices of these risk assets going up and yields going down. I think it's one of the reasons why everybody's worried about this inverted yield curve. But I think that's less about the traditional reasons why a yield curve inverts and more about there's such a demand by investors for yielding assets that they're pushing down the long term, no matter, you know, even though it might not make sense. So I do believe that um, you, you will, going back to the, your first question on rates, I personally don't believe that the Fed will cut rates. I believe that the pause was just that, a pause. Um, and I think what they're trying to avoid is, in fact, a synchronized slowdown and to see if, if at all the, the right. U.S. could be put in a position where it's, in fact, some kind of anchor to windward for the rest of the uh, world economy. But I think the data is just so overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive in the U.S. that it would be very hard to cut rates at this point, notwithstanding, you know, the wall of worry that we have everywhere, Argentina, Italy, et cetera. Well, We've, we've, we've reached the end of the line talking about risk, which puts us in the perfect place uh, to ask you, Laura. You know, if you're looking, when you're thinking about risk and allocate, you know, where money is allocated globally and how to think about risk in this environment, you know, w what are the key points that you're thinking of? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with a few things that have been said. First of all, um, we do not feel this is a synchronized uh, level of activity at all. Um, I think we are most worried about Europe at the moment. Um, I think we've already talked about just how fragile Europe is. I know we'll probably talk about this, but there really is no more monetary policy options available to Europe and, and fiscal options, frankly. So uh, we really are steering away from Europe. I think in the US, I would, we would also agree that the US is not only seeing an increase in growth, but I think we've heard the administration over the last uh, day, even here at the conference, double down on taking action to continue to try and drive that growth. Um, we like equities in the United States. I think uh, there are opportunities. Certainly, valuations are high, but we think that, I mean, frankly, as we, as we re-examine macroeconomics in general, I think we will continue to re-examine what is expensive and what is cheap on the equity side. Uh, and emerging markets, um, while there are certainly hot spots, there are clearly areas, uh, certainly in and around Asia, that we see are benefiting from what we believe will be continued sustained growth in China. Um, there's been a lot of interesting conversation around the slowdown in Germany as it relates to China, um, and we believe that actually, as the Chinese economy continues to um, maintain the six to six and a half percent growth, 
actually uh, some of the issues that Germany has experienced may reverse in particular around their auto sector. Um, so we see that as an opportunity going forward. I mean, there's, there's a lot that's come through that, and I encourage the, the speakers to be, be chipping in now uh, whenever they want to, um, not simultaneously, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> but a few things came out of that. Um, was also mentioned in, in Jerry's session around relationships breaking down. And are they reliable? The signals that we used to talk about in the past, are they reliable anymore? You know, inflation is the key one. I think we've already had a bit of a difference between you two on that because, uh, David, you're asking, you're sort of suggesting that we should just give up on the Phillips curve and we should stop waiting for inflation because we'll die waiting for inflation. I'm reminded, you know, if you think back to maybe 2011, everyone was saying we're going to start to get inflation because we've got quantitative easing, we've got all of these forces, <coughs> and that turned out to be completely wrong. <laughs> Are we now completely wrong to be counting out the risk of inflation? Because there's a lot of the factors that helped keep inflation low do seem to be easing off. They do, uh, but for all of you who are waiting for inflation, I would encourage you to look at the case study of Japan. Um, they have been waiting for a very long time. They have tried all of the monetary and fiscal levers they can find. And the reality is that the change in demographics simply swamps the effect of those others. And so we actually think inflation is likely to stay low for a very long time. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is something that uh, feeds into all of our calculations <coughs> about how we think about uh, rates of return and what we think the right long-term term expected <coughs> yields are on asset classes. And we think in general, people have too high expectations. Well, to, to, to David, to your point about demographics and the effect in Japan, the United States is still is growing in terms of its workforce and population and will probably until 2050. Um, you know, with the chronic shortage of labor we have now, there are more job openings than there are available workers who want to participate. Um, you know, obviously that's going to continue to drive wages up and that's going to increase demand as, as real wages rise and that increased demand will feed back into the real economy and ultimately put pressure on prices. I think Christine Legrand made a very interesting point with the 2% the inflation target, right, which is you know, if we really are, you know, saying we have a 2% inflation target, what's the difference if we overshoot for a period of time? You know, why not just change the inflation target um, and allow the economy to overheat more? And, uh, you know, that might be a more realistic outcome. But, but ultimately, uh, to Stephanie's point, you know, no one has sort of suspended the basic rules of economics. And as, you know, demand continues to rise, it will ultimately push prices up. Who, I mean, just thinking about the panel, I mean, there's a lot of structural factors that have kept uh, inflation low. And especially if you look at the relationship, remember, we have now seen wages go up. So if you're thinking about the first, the two-step <coughs> process of the Phillips curve, you see the un low in unemployment, you start to see the wage growth. And then the key step was going from wage growth to inflation, which we have not seen. I mean, others on the panel, are you expecting that relationship to reassert itself? even though we've seen almost no, you know, we've actually seen companies cut margins rather than raise prices in general. Yeah, I, I think it's hard to say, and I think on top of what uh, was just said, which I agree with a lot of that, you know, look at a lot of industries, and you're essentially seeing scaling and redu reducing pricing uh, power. You know, the financial industry, you know, we're, we're scaling, we're reducing fees, uh, and, it, you know, part of that is your technology enabled to do that. You know, so in, in many respects, are we just waking up to the ability to scale using technology and enhance productivity, which I think was an uh, important point of Madame Lagarde. And so this is, you know, is that the offset to exactly what, you know, you know Scott was saying is, is typically you would expect that Phillips curve uh, thing to, uh, uh, to click in there. And so I, I just think it's, it is different now because we're seeing just a period of time when the way we do business is fundamentally disrupting and changing. So you have to consider that when answering that question. Yeah, yeah maybe I, just to add, Stephanie, I would, I would just reiterate that point. I think what was most interesting to me was Madame Lagarde's point on, on productivity, that we actually don't know whether we're measuring it correctly. We actually don't know how distributed that productivity is. 
I do think you have to acknowledge <coughs> the fact that productivity is probably occurring in very specific pockets in some industries, and in, in essence, you know, in other industries, there's been a complete disintermediation by technology of the workforce. So, uh, yeah, I think it will be very interesting for you know all studiers of the um, the economies around the world to better have a sense of where that productivity number is going, um, because I would suspect that's probably one of the missing elements that we don't have. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I do think we, when we talk about inflation, we have to talk about services versus physical goods. Yeah. And um, I think for years we've seen a distinction that where there actually has been more inflation on a relative basis in services. Uh, but I also think that it's been very hard to measure uh, productivity, particularly in services. Uh, well, I think it was David made the point earlier, it's, it's just relatively recently that you're see, seeing lots of business investment uh, into productivity, particularly among service firms. So I think that in itself uh, should drive more productivity and is definitely going to keep uh, uh, service inflation down. But we should, I mean, the numbers here are pretty big, I guess. I mean, it's always exciting to think we might be just measuring it all wrong. But in some countries, not, not necessarily the US, but you know, the shortfall relative to previous trends in productivity is getting on for 10, 15% of GDP. I mean, you're not going to find that behind the refrigerator uh, or in some change of, of, no, no. of measurement. Um, if we move on to one of the other sort of topics of the day is the yield curve and whether that's still a reliable signal of anything at all. Um, we had that sort of, we, we, sk we skirted around the inversion of the yield curve very briefly, actually, earlier this year. Now we've talked about uh, steepening. Is that another sort of lodestar for, a, for investors that's gone away? You know, you look, at the, you look at the shape of the yield curve and particularly you worry about inversion and it tells you something about the prospects for recession. I don't know. Well, feel strongly about it does that. matter, right? And I don't think you can assume it doesn't matter and inversion wouldn't portend a... Uh, a recession, but if you think about the movements we're looking at over the last decade, you know, the shifts in the curve, are at, the band is very small compared to historical shifts. Uh, at the end of the day, it, it, it doesn't necessarily um, tell you that, that you know, we're heading right into the recession tomorrow. I, you know, I don't know, maybe it will if it truly inverts. Uh, fully, but, you know, I think it does matter, but you got to look at the fundamentals and you got to, you know, invest with a view towards what are the other signals in the economy? Where's growth? Where's earnings? Uh, where's productivity uh, when you're looking at companies and industries? So, it, it, so I think that maybe we're missing the single largest element of risk that's right in front of us. And that's assets are incredibly priced richly around the world. So as long-term investors, our biggest risk right now is how do we put money to work effectively with a decade perspective uh, in a way that's going to hit the same kind of returns that, we, that we've had. And a lot of times people seem to think that volatility is risk. Volatility is not risk. In fact, if you look at the last quarter uh, of last year, we put money into risk assets. We put money into high yield, emerging markets, equities, because we believed the economy was sound and it was an overreaction. And that volatility gave us the opportunity to get in um, at a reasonable cost. What's odd about the first quarter of this year is, in addition to the, the, the sharp snapback, um, is the fact that we're back to very low levels of, uh, of volatility. And uh, to be honest, um, the biggest risk we have is that we don't have a little bit of a correction in prices is not that markets go down. But you said it's going to be very hard to achieve the same rates. You shouldn't be talking about, you shouldn't be hoping to get the same rates, should you? I mean, isn't that part of the problem? There'll be a lack of realism around that? I, I completely agree with you. And I think it's particularly true in the pension world. Um, but uh, if you look at realistic, long-term, uh, expected kind of balanced portfolios, our numbers are around 4%, maybe a little bit bigger for, for long-term returns. And uh, part of that is this lower for longer that we're going to be in, we think, for quite a long period of time. I mean, there was, there was an un almost unprecedented combination of high return for relatively low risk that we've seen throughout this last 10 years or so. I mean, that is the paradigm we have to shift, we have to move away, or assume we're going to move away from, surely. Well, I mean, certainly we should be expecting, you know, reversion to the mean, right? I mean, all of investment work is based on this. 
And uh, you know, it's th this long period of outperformance is eventually going to run into a period of underperformance. Our forward work based on valuations on equities is for US equities, over the next decade, we should be expecting maybe a one to two percent return. I mean, wow. that's a, you know, really, that's a wow. pretty. A year, return. I hope. What's that? A year, that's I hope. On, on average, <laughs> okay. worse than us. Oh. No, in total. <laughs> okay. But but, uh, but I think you know to the point that uh, that we're talking about here. I, I think I'd, I'd like to separate you know the inflation discussion, a lot of other things we're talking about, into cyclical versus secular. I think we understand that we're coming to, that we have cyclical pressures in inflation, at least that's my view, but we are secularly in a long-term low inflation environment, and you're not going to get very high returns on things like bonds in a secular low, long-term low environment for inflation. Well, you've, you've got us on to thinking about sort of par past this cycle, but in order to get past this cycle, you have to have another recession. Um, and one of the things that, that came up a little bit in the Christine Lagarde session is this question of what's the firepower that authorities are going to have when we face inevitable You know, we may not get a lot more inflation. We may be in a permanently low inflation era. I don't think anyone thinks we're not going to get another recession. So you know, how much does that concern you? Well, <clears throat> when you talk about firepower, there's real firepower versus politically available pyro yeah. firepower. And I think if you look at the central banks around the world, certainly the Fed has some, but nowhere near as much firepower. I mean, simply by the fact that rates are up. Um, the, the bigger question, though, is um, would political systems around the world work to put that firepower and employ that firepower? You know, would, would if required, would there be kind of concerted fiscal stimulus? Would there be cooperation of the kind that was needed? And that's where I'm quite skeptical. Um, I think you've got, um, we're at a point with uh, the kind of partisan levels that we're seeing everywhere and the partisanship that we're seeing. It's not clear, but who knows what happens in a crisis, but it's not clear now that you'd see uh, the polity coming together to actually get this done. Yeah, so, I would just add, uh, I think, and you actually can get central bankers to pretty readily admit that in general, there is very little firepower left. I think in the United States, obviously somewhat, again, I think there will be a greater focus on, on fiscal stimulus, but I think in Europe, there really are very, very few options. Uh, and I'm not sure, I have an answer as to what their alternatives are. Um, I think, you know, obviously in the emerging markets, I mean, the one thing we, I would say, is in the power of government and should not be underestimated as a trigger, um, as a tool in their toolbox is regulation. Uh, there has been a significant amount of regulation in the last 10 years, in particular in our industry, which has restricted capital flows, credit, et cetera. Uh, and I think there is absolutely an action for, you know, central banks and regulators around the world to rethink what the consequences, that may be the only thing they have left. And certainly in Europe, I think you can say regulation, over-regulation has been a major contributor to the slowdown in growth, the inability for the banks to perform and lend. Tom, I mean, do you think, uh, when, we, when we look at the next, you know, we had a lot of things that were exceptional last mm -hmm. time, which are going to seem normal next time, yeah. you know, the kind of expanding of the central bank balance sheets. Mm -hmm. Are we also going to see that kind of change on fiscal policy, do you think? I mean, people in markets should expect to see much looser for longer fiscal policy as well? I think that's hard to say because I think if you think about the crisis, there was coordinated central bank <coughs> intervention and in the U.S. at the time and in other areas, the ability of the political environment to come together during the crisis. But then in this last decade, you know, you've seen the political landscape change greatly. I think it's harder to imagine uh, today if we were faced with the same crisis and the state of political engagement in the world, the same type of collaboration we saw out of you know, G G8, G20 type countries um, if it happened today. And that's one thing I worry about is uh, I think the uh, it, the monetary tools are less because they've, you know, the rates are very low and, and done a lot of easing. 
and I don't have a lot of confidence that coordinated fiscal policy could offset another crisis. But I, I would say that, uh, and as you heard before, my major concern really is, is Europe. Um, when I have the opportunity to meet with uh, the leaders in Europe, I think there are some real lessons from how the U.S. handled coming out of this crisis that they should take note of. Not that we got, you know, everything right, but, uh, you know, first, they need to be much more uh, aggressive with the banks. Um, there are still a lot of assets on the balance sheets that shouldn't be, that need to be taken care of so they can get back to lending. Secondly, fiscal policy, they do need to think about the role of reflating some of their economies uh, during periods of, of downturn in a, in a more aggressive way that they, uh, than they have. And the third is that, uh, you know, the EU has not really yet completely harmonized their approach to banking regulation and reform. And, uh, you know, the capital markets have not yet really come to being a unified whole. And I think that they need to take those final steps. So I think there's some very clear things uh, that Europe needs to do uh, to get ready for the next turn. And guess what? If you talk to any senior leader in Europe, they'll tell you none of those things are going to happen I, this side of the next recession. I think that's <laughs> regrettably true. But what does that mean? Does that make Europe an, a no-go zone uh, if you start to worry about the end of the cycle? Well, I mean, look, I, I was at an IMF meeting a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> and uh, the conclusion from some very senior people was the European experiment is in great danger. Uh, you know, they, they have failed to make the transition to looking at Europe uh, broadly. For instance, if you take the Deutsche Commerzbank merger discussions, they, the discussion keeps focusing on they need a German champion, right? Well, no, they need, what Europe needs is a European champion, right? And so, um, you know, given the fact that when you look at, you know, the monetary space, the policy space on the monetary side, I, I think they're out of bullets, uh, or they're very close. And, uh, you know, with the leadership changes that are coming, uh, the, only, the only hope Europe has in the near term is to kick the can down the road uh, and try to keep the experiment going. But, the, but until they make the real structural changes, Europe just isn't a very interesting place. Is there anyone, I mean, I'm British, I'm always gloomy about Europe. I love to be pessimistic about Europe not doing anything. But this seems to me, <laughs> this seems to me a bit overdoing it. If you actually look at the pace of, they have managed to maintain the recovery. Germany has managed to be the most successful, uh, one of the biggest exporters in the world for many, many years to come, for good or ill. Um, there's some good things that are happening in Europe. Are we at risk of being a little too gloomy? Or is there no limit to our gloom? I mean, there, there's clearly been some good. And if you look at the last 20, 25 years, I mean, if, if you think about the economies of Eastern Europe, if you think about what were we talking about when Germany in the early 90s, we were talking about the death of Germany uh, and that reunification was going to be the final kind of stake in the heart. And in fact, it turned to be an extraordinary engine. But I think the question, what you're hearing from the panel, Stephanie, is what's next? And Europe feels like it's at a point where, you know, particularly with Brexit and particularly with some of the, you know, you've got Italy wobbling, um, is, is it going to retreat or is it going to go forward? I think what, what you're seeing is staying where it is is, prob is not, it's not probably, it is not a long-term solution. So it's either got to retreat back to some kind of a customs union where everybody's on uh, its own bottom or it's got to make that kind of fiscal unification, that tax unification. Uh, I think Scott's point on, you know, the, the dialogue still is, is still very national. And that's fine, but that's not consistent with the kind of European Union that the Europeans say they want. Right. I mean, one of the things that we uh, see in Europe, which is not unique to Europe, although they have a particularly kind of intense um, cocktail, is, is populism mm. and uh, the political economy really uh, rearing its head and making itself something that investors have to think about. You know, we get election results, we actually had a reasonably reassuring result in uh, Spain at the weekend, but you know, populism is alive and well um, in Europe and indeed in the US. Uh, how are you thinking relative to a couple of years ago, how much is politics featuring in your assessments of the prospects? Well, <coughs> po politics. Not just for Europe, I should say, but just yeah, the Politics, well, there's two components, I'd separate them. There's, there's the political component of, you know, who's in office and, 
you know, the, the fiscal policies of the administration or, uh, and, and we've seen that move around with nationalism and populism type votes. But I think there's, there's another element of this that really is a difference in the world and that's really about sustainability and, and this, you know, the view, not just of the environment, which is obviously a very important part, and I thought it was very interesting the comment uh, Madame Lagarde made about that. You know, we have to be more aware of what's going on in our environment. We have to be more aware of the inequity in incomes and the disruption that uh, these secular changes in, in jobs and technology and training are occurring. And in many respects, if we j wait for the political systems to figure it out, we're going to only fall further behind. I think, you know, industries in financial services and healthcare and, and others need to lead this time. You know, we need to lead to help society manage these, these changes. And they play a big role ultimately in an economic growth or recession uh, if we tackle these issues of sustainability Etc. I mean, David, I know you've written a, you've written a piece, I think it's for the conference or it's for, for Milken mm -hmm. about, yeah. about some of these th themes. You know, we've got the, the title of the whole, uh, this whole week is uh, Driving Shared Prosperity. I think the emphasis is supposed to be on the shared. Um, what, are you, what are some of the implications that you've talked about? So the main theme, uh, I would say, is that uh, America is a rich country, but it is not prosperous. And I think we've really got to get under why it feels that way to, to, to many of us. But I think we also need to get to the right diagnosis of the problem. And I do think income equality, while important, is too narrow. So we have to start with the big picture. And the big picture is that over the last 30 years, uh, the movement toward more capitalism in countries, relatively open trade, and free capital has actually moved two billion people out of poverty around the planet. Um, uh, more than a billion people have joined the middle class. In fact, every year, 165 million people join the middle class. That's about half of the American population um, every year. So from a full kind of global perspective, actually inequality has been getting better and better and better. It's because the bottom has been coming up and more people have been coming to the middle, even while we've had more people in the upper echelons. But it doesn't feel that way in most of the developed markets. But I think we have to recognize the good so that we don't lose that uh, as we begin to fix some of the things that are, that are broken. Um, having said all of that, uh, what is the problem then with America? I would say that it is a combination of income equality, but also three other trends. Uh, first is the loss of hope. Um, you know, study after study shows that people, uh, children will not be as well off as they were. Um, and people don't feel that their social mobility is what it was. Secondly, the American economy has lost a lot of its dynamism. Part of that has just been growth, but part of it has been small business formation and more jobs. And the last, and I would say the most important, is the increase in the sense of vulnerability. 40% of America cannot really handle a $500 unexpected expense. Can you imagine the, the personal stress that being in that situation causes? And so it's not just the income equality. When you take that package of things together, you begin to understand just how powerfully and emotionally Americans feel that their country is not prosperous. But I can imagine we're going to have all of you will tell me how important these themes are. And at events like this, and I think particularly this week, we were all talking about it. But are we anywhere close to talking about the kinds of policies that will move the dial on these issues? Lara. Uh, I think my view on policies is no. I think, though, what we are seeing, and we're certainly seeing it in our business, is back to relationships changing. There are obviously new public-private relationships that are being struck. I mean, in a way, I actually think um, the theme of populism is, is, at the end of the day, not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Um, and in fact, Europe, interestingly enough, to the degree they become majority populism, we may start to get policies that we can all get behind. But I think public and private partnerships we're definitely seeing. 
Um, we are starting to see new relationships even within the financial services, private to private, uh, to begin to drive these things forward. Um, so, you know, I'm optimistic that we will find solutions. Um, I would also just say this is, this is not an old problem. You know, we can quote, you know, I can quote statistics on wealth. Um, it's, you know, the world's getting wealthier. We are getting more divergent from the lower end of the wealth to the higher end of the wealth stream. Um, you know, but Andrew Carnegie, a uh, great American entrepreneur said, you know, uh, if a man dies rich, he thus dies disgraced. There have been amazing entrepreneurs in the United States historically who have taken their wealth and put it to good use. And I would just make one last point. Um, Mike Milliken made this point yesterday. I would not just think about public to private in infrastructure or, you know, corporate uh, investment, but I think education has got to be a, a major, major focus. Um, again, Andrew Carnegie, great example. If we don't find ways to think about education as a key policy initiative, whether you're in a populist country or not, um, I do think we will end up in a place where <coughs> we will be even further away from, from successful policy development. I, I would just add that I think that, uh, let's take a specific example of where the people in this room can make a huge difference. And I think we can call to the private sector on that. And that is to really lean in to education and the skills gap that we have in this country. I think Scott pointed out there are actually more job openings now than we have unemployed. Um, but unfortunately, there's no skill match between the two. And if you play the economy out forward, we need more coders, more data sciences, we need more nurse practitioners, but those aren't the kinds of jobs that are being produced out of our educational and vocational training. And businesses around the country um, can really lean in and take a much more proactive role in terms of making sure that they are investing in their own workers and making sure that they're investing in schools and universities near them that are, are developing the kinds of skills that they need. We can also do a much better job in investing in people who've fallen out of the economy. So at Prudential, we've really leaned into Opportunity Youth, which are the group of people from kind of 18 to 25 who are neither in education education or an employment and gotten them, really tried to focus on getting them into a job and getting them vocational skills training. Because we know that if they can get a job and they can get a skill for the economy overall, that is an enormous win. And if we don't fix this, this skills gap, we are going to go nowhere fast as an economic uh, growth engine. I, don't, I think the challenge, <clears throat> though, in this is um, it's very hard to think of a time where we've actually done this. Right. Um, if you go back to, and we've had many cycles over the past 200 years where new technology has come in, it's, uh, it's forced existing labor aside, new kinds of skills were required. Historically, the way that happened is that generation was lost. And I don't think as a society we're willing to tolerate that. Uh, we're not willing to just let a generation be lost and just move on to the next one. It's very easy to say that Yep, don't worry about it. You were doing X, but go get the skills, and now you can do Y. Right? Typically, it's a generation later that does all that. True. So how we think about reskilling, um, and I don't think it's necessarily saying to the 54-year-old, you know, good news, we're going to invest in your reskilling. There's a university back east that you can go to. It's not going to work that way. Right. So how do we think about that, whether it's on-the-job training or digital delivery? And right. we, we, we don't have the model yet and we need to think about what that is. But, Scott. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking of Franklin Roosevelt when he became president, and the system had totally collapsed, and he basically, uh, my grandfather refused to speak to someone that voted for Roosevelt because he voted for Hoover. <laughs> and the point was that... It's good we don't have that kind of vicious Yeah, we don't have that, no, exactly. No, yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, that the point was that, that Roosevelt was the savior of his class. Uh, if it hadn't been for Roosevelt, we would, have be we would have probably spilled into socialism or something else at the time. The, the reality today is that we are coming to a juncture where we are going to have very radical changes unless business and other people step up and do something, the things that we're talking about here today. And, you know, I'll, I'll give you one last thing, is the, the college admission scandal is the, the poster child for the lower and middle classes to say that the entitled are right. controlling everything. And so I endorse Mike Milken's idea, which is college tuition should be free. 
and I'll pick on my own university, the University of Pennsylvania has a huge endowment, spends lots of money on buildings, but won't give free tuition to the students. What's more important, you know, that we have marble sidewalks or that we have an open system where the best people can have access to the best education without, regardless of finance? Okay, and I, all right, well. I, I will be running on 20 to 2020 ticket. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but this is interesting. It's interesting you say that, though, because we're not actually talking about some of the things. I mean, all the scientific evidence, such as it is, uh, and even non-scientific evidence, shows that you need money to do this stuff. You need money for education that you all say you want, for universities, for retraining, for skills. The U.S. is spending less, the public sector is spending less on all of those things, in part because tax revenues are falling. Uh, we have seen the tax system uh, become less progressive over the last few years. We've seen t taxation of wealth, which is such a key driver of inequality, and a lack of wealth being a, such a key source of vulnerability for people, reduced over the last few years. I mean, are we, is this is all a bit of a sort of fake conversation because some of the key policy changes you would need are not being discussed. And actually, there's been a lot of support for the opposite policies, policies that took taxes off capital. So how are we going to change that paradigm? I mean, I, I, look, I mean, I would just maybe suggest a few things. One, um, I would agree probably, and I'm sure there's some, some senior heads of universities around the room, the, the, the advanced education sector in the United States and globally has been the weakest adopter of technology to make education more accessible to the masses. Sure. And as a result, they have not gone through the pricing transformation that everyone else has. So I think that has to be a priority for those institutions. I think second though, what I would say is, it is in every company's best interest back to the productivity point. If productivity is the way for companies to continue to be able to grow, they are the place where that investment has to take place. Um, investment in workers, investment in training individuals. I'm not sure you can leave it to higher education. In Switzerland, obviously, where I live, there's this rich um, history of apprenticeship. Um, you know, we started to question in our requirements for resumes, do you really need a college degree to do some of the roles that we have? So I agree with you, I think on the political front, um, you know, the lobbying has suggested that in fact, policy is not heading in the right direction, but this is where I would say, businesses must step forward mm -hmm. because it is in their interest alone to solve this problem. Yeah, and I, I agree, I think, you know, and I think the points Scott and Laura made are very important. And it's not just at the uh, elite collegiate level, we gotta look down to primary education. And, and yes, you know, you have the certain basics you're going to teach here, but should we be teaching other skills that are more directly transferable into the market? And not everybody necessarily is, needs to go four years of college and incur massive debt when they could get jobs that have very good career paths because of the skill set can be learned in part in their primary education or in, in a two-year type framework. So I think we have to look at the whole education system. It's not just the, the four-year colleges, it's the community colleges which are an underappreciated gold mine if, if invested in the right way. And that's how do we change the curriculum in primary education to prepare uh, children or, or youth for the real world and I would agree as businesses, we're not always used to looking down to the primary education. We're kind of looking at where we're recruiting. I think we got to put more time, effort, and money into primary education. But, and support for money into primary But I think education. sometimes the, the uh, conversation gets too much to how are we going to pay for this and not at the, some of the real issues. So let me take, I, I, do, I do believe we need to lead into the, the skill issue, but the other one we need to lean into is infrastructure. So we need uh, about a hundred billion dollars a year in the United States investment in infrastructure to begin to really upgrade it. That's actually kind of equivalent to a Marshall Plan-like uh, level of investment in the United States. Um, how do we do that? How, it, it, certainly government is not going to be able to, to, uh, to pay for that. Uh, and yet many countries around the world have solved this problem. So let's just take airports. 
Uh, so we're the only country in the world that tries to pay for its airports through a per-ticket uh, surcharge. Everywhere else, pretty much, they've decided that they're going to create public-private partnerships. They're going to actually create a way for equity holders to invest in that. And I can assure you, once you get the equity into that, there is plenty of debt that wants to invest in infrastructure because of all the hunt for yield that we were talking about a moment ago. So there are actual <coughs> ways, and it's been proven in Australia and parts of the UK, of how to structure infra infrastructure deals that can be financed by the private sector. We just need to be much more creative, and we need to bring that dynamism back to the American economy. But the kind of levels of public investment you're talking about were, or infrastructure investment, were managed through the public sector back in the 60s without too much trouble. So it's not impossible to have this be public. The demographics invested. were pretty different in the 60s right. than well, they are now. Yeah. And, and the, the, I mean, the entitlements programs have become exactly so right. heavy, the burden. Entitlement, reform, it, this is very interesting, I think, that the, the participation rate of Americans in the labor force is like the lowest in the developed world, uh, well behind Japan, uh, well behind Europe. Um, why is that? Well, there, the incentives are that, you know, we're 65, we retire, we're entitled to a retirement. Does anyone really know why 65 is the retirement age? Right, I'll tell you why. Otto von Bismarck decided in the Prussian Empire that if you live to 65, you should have a, a pension. Right? I think the world has changed a little bit since so Prussia. You deserved a medal in right? it. You know. <laughs> so my attitude is, you know, we need to reform Social Security. We need to incentivize people to stay in the labor force longer. Business needs to provide the training and support and the encouragement to keep people working. And uh, we need to find ways to grow the labor force because Ultimately, it's only with a larger labor force in America that we're going to be competitive with China and other nations. I think going back, Stephanie, to the infrastructure point that David made, the, 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 there's almost universal investor demand for more infrastructure assets. They fit the liability stream of these investors, very long-term investments, typically paying some kind of a yield. The, the challenge in the United States and why the comparison of the United States to other countries doesn't really hold is most of these assets are owned or controlled at the state, if not local level. Absolutely right. So kind of the, the political complications of actually getting this done uh, are quite high. And I think that you know, for all the talk about public-private partnerships, the way to actually drive this forward is there essentially needs to be the equivalent of a convention right, between the federal government and all the states to figure out how to kind of work their way through this. Because ultimately, if you're an investor and you're facing a project that may have a 10-year permitting, you're not going to invest in it. Right? So this is not for lack of investor demand. There's plenty of investor demand for this. It's, it's, there's not the this, this system in place to actually make this public-private partnership work. Okay, so we've got less than five minutes left. Um, in many ways, I've completely failed because uh, <laughs> we have talked a lot about macro and policy and uh, less about investment. But I think it's a sort of reflection of the times that actually investors are having to think about models for infrastructure and uh, the participation rate in the labor force and uh, maybe a lot of issues that we wouldn't have talked so much about uh, five years ago. If I just go through, uh, starting with you, Laura, if we end with just the sort of the one thing that you're looking at most when you think about the risks to the medium term um, investment landscape, what's, what's the thing that you're most focused on, very briefly? Well, I mean, I hate to say I'll have to come back to Europe. Um, I mean, I agree with you. I think you can be overly pessimistic, but I, I do worry that, um, you know, we are in a period where small uh, earthquakes can lead to large tsunamis, and um, it seems to be the place that is most fragile, whether, you know, you're talking, we just talked about the United States and potentially between the states and federal government, some of the disparities, I mean, Europe in many ways is an example of that, um, you know, as a region. And I think there's highly likely with the number of elections coming over the next year or so that we will see some shocks. So our concern is you have those shocks, no monetary options, no fiscal options, frankly, not as developed financial markets uh, as you see here in the US, some but not strong exposure to the Asian region, 
um, which I think is probably the, the buoyant um, area around the globe. Uh, so those would be, from our perspective, the, the place we're worried about. Ron, briefly. Yeah, I'm not sure whether it's a risk or a phenomenon, but I think it's this idea that um, particularly since everything requires technology, what are the scale requirements? And are we seeing inevitable consolidation across virtually every industry, right? Um, in, in banking, we were talking about this earlier in the, in the, uh, before we came out here, we're, we're in the situation now in financial services between regulation and how to effectively employ technology that it's no longer too big to fail, it's too small to scale. Mm -hmm. And I think that's happening in, in industries around the world where you're seeing this, you know, it's great to develop the app, but the app doesn't work unless you have the platform. And you can't develop the platform unless you have scale. So um, how do we think as investors about what to invest in <coughs> that's ultimately going to achieve the kind of scale that we think we need? Scott. I, I'm, I'm with Laura in that I, I think that uh, I'm concerned about the butterfly effect. Uh, that uh, risk premia are so low, assets are so highly valued that all these unresolved issues, uh, whether it be in Europe or Latin America or elsewhere, that uh, just like 1998 with the Asian crisis, that an event like devaluing the Thai bot will set off a chain reaction that we're not prepared for. But longer term, the real risk that I see is that we will end up back in ultimately an inflationary malaise because we don't have real policy solutions. And what we're living through today looks to me like a lot like the 1940s and 1950s. And ultimately when the 60s came and the, the expansion of the deficits with the Vietnam War, inflation began to take off. So we're just like the, the frog, proverbial frog in the pot of water. How do you boil a frog? You just put it in cold water and turn up the heat and let the, the pot slowly come to a boil. Right. So but I'm an optimist. <laughs> you're optimist, but you take, except that we need FDR to fix what ails us. That's the only, the only slight uh, problem. Uh, David. So I, I would agree that the systematic undervaluation of risk premium is a major risk. But I think, you know, we all suffer from fighting the last war. And I think we all are still very much uh, aware of what happened in the great financial crisis. But the next crisis is going to come from a different place. And I think it's likely to come from technology and uh, cyber. Yeah. And I think if I were looking for the thing that worries me the most, it would be an actual attack on the infrastructure of the financial markets um, that really did burst uh, into it and create a shutdown of the major pipes of how we do business. It's something we spend a lot of time uh, working on and investing in, but I think we're going to see uh, risks from a different angle than what we did before. Tom. Well, there's, I agree with everything. I'm really worried bang. right now. <laughs> um, I think I need to have a drink. Yeah. It, it, I, I, your point is very good, and I think you know, one of the things from an investor's view in the short to medium term, to go back to your question, you have to be asking these questions in your analysis. So when, when we're investing in bonds or equities or uh, whatever, you know, what's gonna disrupt those companies that we may be investing in today? And are they aware of it? And it's something you know, we talk about with, with our investment professionals is what changes or disrupts an industry that we're long currently? The other thing is, is you gotta look at it relative to, to yourself and how you serve your clients. You know, are we disrupting ourselves to bring, you know, a, a better result to our clients more efficiently over time to, to Ron's point about scaling. So it's a lot to keep you up at night. <laughs> Well, we have had a pretty uh, wide ranging discussion. I want to thank you all. For me, the takeaways are, uh, We've got no ammunition for fighting the next crisis, and we think the system is completely unsustainable as it is, and we don't really know how to fix it. <laughs> but apart from that, everything We're great. optimistic. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done. Thank you for attending. Please make your way to the next session, and be sure to check the app for the latest schedule and session locations.